Well, welcome. Hello there. So in this very first video of Unit 4 Market Structures, um, I'm first off just going to tell you I'm really glad you're here because this is the most important of the units in this entire microeconomics class. It's where we take some of the ideas about demand and supply, um, and then we really look at like what does the real world kind of look like in terms of outside of the supply and demand market that we've just looked at. Um, what are different other market structures? So things like monopolies, oligopolies, and monopolistic competition. So let's get started. If you were here in class, what you would have kind of gotten was a little bit of an introduction to the different structures using can Candy. And so what I give out are little pieces of candy, and then we kind of talk about types of goods and number of firms and things like that. That's the simulation that we would have done here. I'm sorry if you weren't in class, you didn't get the piece of candy and the explanation as well that went along with it. So I'll do my best. Um, this lecture is really just about kind of explaining and introducing you to the basic market structures. And then the bottom part is actually a review of perfect competition, You're kind of just giving it a name and saying, hey, this is the thing we've been looking at the whole time. So let's get started. Um, with a monopoly, the number of firms is one mono one firm, right? Most people know that. Um, and so we would say that there is a complete, right? Complete control over the price. Another way that we would say is that this is a price maker, price maker. They actually get to just choose what the price is going to be. Um, and they choose the price and the quantity that they're going to actually produce. So we'd say they choose choose the price and the quantity. Now, they're still subject to the consumer demand. They can't just charge like ex exceptionally high prices. They, they sometimes will, and they will charge higher than what a competitive market would do, but they are still limited by consumer demand, we would say. Um, they also have different types of goods that these different kinds of market structures generate. If it's a monopoly and there's only one firm producing it, then it has to be a unique good, actually. So it's a type of good that you can't swap out with something else. Otherwise, there would be more firms that are generating it. And typically, um, with monopolies, they have very high barriers to entry, right? So barriers to entry means that it's difficult for new companies to open up. Sometimes we would say they're legal, right? And sometimes they're more um, in terms of like resource control, right? Resource control. And then sometimes it's just like high fixed cost. So there are different reasons why there might be actually really high barriers to entry, um, but it could be a legal thing. It could be that there's a, a patent, right? For example, any kind of a patent or a copyright on a particular product means there's a monopoly on that product. So it could be legal. Um, it could be a regulatory legal thing that says we only are going to allow one water company to operate in this area, right? Sometimes that just makes sense. Sometimes it could be resource control. It could be that they have a very um, strict ability to control the particular resource that they're selling. Maybe the company has bought up all of, for example, the nickel mine. Mines. Um, for many, many decades, there was one nickel mining company that actually owned an enormous amount of nickel all around the world, the metal nickel. And so they had a monopoly on it just through resource control. Other companies sometimes have very high fixed costs to start up. So a water company or an electric company, and it's very difficult to break into that market because you would have to spend a huge amount of money setting up power plants and transmission lines and things like that. Even if you had a legal ability to separate and create a new electric company, you just would have such enormous startup costs that effectively the pre-existing electric company operates as a monopoly because of that high fixed cost startup. So then we have a second type of market structure called an oligopoly. Olig means few. And so we're going to say two to about 10, um, two to about 10. And the two would be a duopoly, right? Two companies. Typically, we'd say that any more than about six, seven or eight large companies in the market basically ends up um, not being an oligopoly anymore. The key characteristic here is that there's few enough that they are interdependent. And that's a word you're going to hear, interdependent, dependent, interdependent. That means that the outcome of one is affected by the decisions of the other. They're interdependent on each other. And so they have to kind of make different decisions about how much to produce and whether they're going to price high or low. And it actually uses a branch of mathematics called game theory, that that's how they make those decisions. And so we'd say they have some control over the price. Um, and we would classify them as a form of a price maker in a way, but it's often still going to be interdependent on what the other firms are doing, right? So they have some control. They can say, we're going to price high, we're going to price way up here. But at the same time, the outcome of them doing that will be affected by what the other firms decide to do because there's few enough of them. And when we talk about kind of types of goods, another way to think about this would be examples, right? So we could say like utilities is an example of a monopoly very often, um, or we could say Say, you know, patented things, patents, patented goods, 
right? But here we could also say types of goods, these would often be differentiated or identical. And this is a different way that we can kind of describe goods or identical. And what that means is that the kinds of goods that oligopolies produce are sometimes a little bit distinguished from each other. So for example, the airline industry is a good example of the oligopolies, right? So airlines. And you could think about that, like different airlines have different kind of ways that they distinguish their product. You have JetBlue, which kind of focuses on business travelers. You have Southwest, which kind of focuses on families. You have, say, American Airlines and Delta Airlines, which are called flag carriers. Those are kind of considered like the, the gold standard of operations. You have some kind of really cheap ones ones that are like frontier. They, they're kind of for the budget minded travelers. So they differentiate the products. Another one would be cars, right? There's about two to a so 10 or so car companies and they differentiate their products. There are some oligopolies though that sell identical products. And oftentimes those will be kind of producers of raw materials. Um, they might produce, for example, um, seeds. They might produce, for example, um, different like inputs into production processes. So those are a little bit harder to spot, but there's also others um, that are that are literally identical um, and, and they kind of show up in different places at different times. Cell phone service is another one where they're providing essentially an identical product, which is talking over a cell phone network, but the cell phone industry is effectively a duopoly in most parts of the United States. The, t the barriers to, go to entry are typically high, but not as high as a monopoly, as much as monopoly. And so, you know, you can kind of think about how hard is it to start an airline company or a car company? In the last hundred years in the United States, there have only been a handful of new car companies that have actually become successful. Um, the rare success story is actually Tesla. And for most of its early history, Tesla was not profitable. So for a long time, people were not sure even if Tesla was going to become a viable company. And even today, there's still only, you know, there's still only a very small part of the overall market, right? The oligopoly of Toyota, Honda, Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis is still a dominant kind of oligopoly in the United States for new car sales because it's such a high barrier to entry. There's high fixed costs to start up. There's a lot of legal issues. Think about cell phones. It's the same issue. Airlines, huge startup costs and that kind of stuff. Airlines also have the resource control. You may not know, but when you land in a particular gate in an airport, that airline has kind of reserved and paid for that gate. And so there are a limited number of gates at most major international airports. So we would say that airlines also have kind of a little bit of that resource control in terms of why there would be barriers to new companies opening. The third type of market is called monopolistic competition. And this one is basically the type where there's a little bit of perfect competition and there's a little bit of this kind of oligopolistic and monopolistic side of thing. It's a mix of both. This is where we're talking from about 10 all the way up to maybe 100 um, number of firms. And they're not interdependent. They're not interdependent. That means that the choice interdependent, I got to take a second to spell the choice basically about how to produce and how much to produce and all those things. It's not going to really be affected by what the other companies are choosing to do in these circumstances. Oh my, the sun just came out. Whoa, that's really bright. Um, so sorry if this gets a little bit difficult. Holy smokes. Let's see if I can block that view a little bit. Oh my gosh. I'm being blinded. Blinded by the light. I don't know the rest of the word. That's slightly better. Okay, good. There. Um, control over the price. We'd say that monopolistic competition has, again, some, but very little in the sense that for them, they're really still going to be focused where MR equals MC. That's how they're going to decide to produce. Um, and this, this one up here is as well. But when we kind of come back and talk about this, we'll say that basically they get to choose, but they're going to be affected to some extent also by other market forces, by other companies entering the market and leaving the market. We'll come back and we'll look at what that means later. Um, examples of these would be like restaurants, right? Restaurants, retail. So any kind of sh stores, grocery stores are a great example of monopolistic competition. Because typically in a given geographic area, you've got a couple dozen in a large geographic area. You've got a couple dozen of these types of stores um, in any given area. And so they are monopolistically competitive. What that means is that there's too many of them to be interdependent, like an oligopoly. Now, if you were in a really, really small town and you only had, say, two restaurants, then it could be an oligopoly, right? Um, and, and so that is kind of a thing to think about is like talking about the geographic area, the reach of the particular firms. Likewise, these also produce differentiated or identical products. Sometimes, you know, you're talking about a grocery store, they sell differentiated products. It's a little bit unusual for them to sell identical. So we would say that they're mostly gonna be differentiated. And again, differentiated here just means that the firms make an attempt to distinguish between their products. They say, mine's better than this one. And maybe it is in terms of quality, or maybe it's, you know, that they get there a little 
little bit faster, right? When we we're talking about airlines, maybe we're getting there a little bit cheaper, the seat's gonna be less comfortable, stuff like that. When we say barriers to entry here, we're gonna say relatively low, but they exist. And what that means is that firms are gonna be able to enter and exit. Firms easily, and we're gonna say easily, enter and exit. And they enter and exit in response to profit and loss. And so that's gonna be another feature when we get down to this level for perfect competition is that firms will enter and exit instantaneously. There's essentially no difficulty in starting up a new company or shutting down. We know that with monopolistic competition, it's a little bit more of a realistic look at the world. We would say that there is a little bit of a barrier. They do exist, um, you know, but, but we kind of say that in the long run, in a week, two months, couple of months, a year, there is some entry and exit that we do see grocery stores and restaurants and retail stores open and close. The last type here would be anything where it's maybe greater than 100, right? So lots, so many that none affect the price and quantity alone. So all by themselves, none of them in perfect competition would be able to actually affect the price or the quantity alone. There's so many firms producing this product. We would also say that that means they have no control over the price, none. So they are what we call price takers. We learned that in the last unit um, that a perfectly competitive firm will just take kind of whatever the market price is. A lot of times there are perfectly competitive markets or the ones that approximate perfectly competitive markets in things like basic resources. So we would often talk about something like maybe corn or the ag, ag kind of outputs, agricultural outputs. Those are often produced in a perfectly competitive or similarly to perfectly competitive markets. You have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies, um, farmers in the United States, thousands actually, all producing corn and identical corn. They're literally buying their seeds from the exact same supplier. They're growing them. The corn grows to the exact same. It's even genetically the same product. And so these are all identical products. Um, and there's no attempt to differentiate them. And each individual farmer is such a small part of that market that they can't really move the market price or quantity all that much. Maybe a tiny bit, but not very much. We would say that there are no barriers to entry and exit. No barriers. And what that means is that firms enter and exit very easily. And what that really means for us is that if there's profit to be made in a perfectly competitive market, other companies are going to join in and open up in that market. And it's actually going to eliminate that profit. If companies are losing money in that market, then companies are going to instantaneously shut down and die off and go away. So sad. But that the other companies then will start to get a little bit more of the income, right, from that company that shut down. They're not kind of taking up those customers. And so the remaining firms are going to be able to basically kind of increase the amount of money they make until finally they break even again. So again, this is kind of the model that we've been looking at actually since the beginning of this whole semester has been perfectly competitive. So let's take a look at what that looked like. Um, in the first unit, when we learned about supply and demand, we had some assumptions, right? These are the, just basically repeated. These are also some assumptions that we learned from previous units where we said that perfectly competitive firms are price takers. Therefore, the price that the firm gets is also equal to its marginal revenue and the demand for the firm's products, while the marginal cost curve for the firm is equal to basically its supply curve. We also know that perfectly competitive firms are efficient. There's two different types of efficiency, and we're going to get really familiar with especially this first one, allocative and productive efficiency. Allocative means that we're actually producing the quantity where marginal cost is equal to the price that the consumers paid. Another way to think about that is where the firm's supply curve is equal to the firm's demand curve. We can also talk about it as the socially optimal quantity that's being produced, where we're maximizing total surplus. So this would be maximizing total surplus. And we would also say no deadweight loss, right? That's a true statement about allocative efficiency is that you don't have any deadweight loss. Productive efficiency means two different things. One, and they're the same thing, but there are two different ways of defining it. One is that you're producing on the production possibilities curve. You're fully utilizing your resources efficiently as you're producing. The other is that you're producing at the minimum of your average total cost curve. And we would say that perfectly competitive firms are efficient in both ways when they're in long run equilibrium. And we'll draw that here right below. So when we draw the market and the firm, this is exactly the same kind of graph that we practiced in our last unit. We're going to do price and quantity, price and quantity, price and quantity. And for the perfectly competitive market, we have a downward sloping demand and an upward sloping supply. There's going to be an equilibrium quantity in the market and an equilibrium price in that market. And so we've done that one, we've done that one, we've done that one, we've done that one. And then we're going to go across, dash line all the way across, 
and we're going to do the price that the firm charges is the same as the market. That's telling us this firm is a price taker. We go straight across and we say marginal revenue is equal to the demand that the firm sees for its products. That's what that F stands for, is that telling us this is the demand for the firm's products. And I know this is a, a little wonky, but it should be a horizontal line. Then we've got a marginal cost curve here that's effectively equivalent to the firm's supply curve, as long as we don't include that little tail hook at the beginning there. Everything past that is the firm's supply curve. We know that the equilibrium point is determined by where MR equals MC. That's where the firm profit maximizes. So we'd say quantity the firm produces. So we've got MR, DF, PF, MC, SF. I put that on there even though I didn't have to. So we'll say quantity QF. And we need an ATC. Now, in long run equilibrium, the ATC will actually cross right through down, take your pen off and come back off ATC. It'll look like that. And this is what we call long run because this is actually the firm breaking even, right? Notice here, minimum ATC. So we are productive efficient. Ta-da. In addition, we are where here is MC equals the price and supply for the firm equals the demand for the firm. So we call that allocative efficient. And so we actually are efficient, right? We're producing at minimum ATC. That's the productive efficient point. And we're allocative efficient because the marginal cost is equal to the price that we charge. So there are kind of two tests there, and there is no deadweight loss here. We are um, breaking even because P equals the ATC at QF. And that's basically telling us that this firm's earning normal economic profit, normal profit or breaking even. That's the same, same thing, means the same thing. Zero economic profit, the firm is breaking even at ATC equals the price, and that is also true in equilibrium. So this gives us kind of the basic overview of perfect competition, long run equilibrium, and then introduces you to some of these market structures. Hopefully this didn't take us 40 minutes to do, but I'm sorry you didn't get any candy. Uh, I'll see you next time.